Welcome, everyone, to another week, another uh, session. And this week, it's a, one you've all wanted. It's how to pin hook a foal. And who better to talk about it than our three panellists today? We've uh, Roger O'Callaghan, Ed Sackville, and Philip Stoffenberg. Um, we're going to start, I suppose, with Philip, for you, with you, and thinking pin hooking a foal and you getting into this industry. Where did it all begin for you and your journey into becoming one of the industry's leading pin hookers? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it all started with soul jumping uh, plenty of years ago as a child. But then as I didn't become Olympic champion or this, this plan didn't work out, I went into thoroughbreds. And uh, first I was only managing um, other farms and uh, doing working with other breeders. And then set up our own farm and focused on the own breeding operation. And then <coughs> I approached to, um, to pin up my first foal in 2012. And from there it started. So I might be the oldest by age, but I'm I'm, I'm the youngest by um, doing that pin hooking business <laughs> of the three. And Ed, apart from being a very avid reader from all the books in the background of your uh, video <laughs> uh, just now, well, you also pin hook the occasional fall, and you you know, you're a flying start graduate yourself. You your kind of involvement in, and also you know you bought. A classic winner of our, one of our, our other panelists. I suppose your involvement in pin hooking falls and you know where that kind of fits into in your whole Sackville Donald empire. Uh, I must admit, it's something which I sort of never really intentionally did, and I sort of started off buying yearlings, and um, as you said, I had a bit of success there, uh, particularly buying off Roger. But uh, I really got into pin hooking. Um, Initially, when I uh, worked at High Clear Stud for John Warren, uh, John's son and I, Jake, uh, we pinhooked a couple of foals and uh, it went, one of them was a disaster and the other one did well and we did it the following year and we went from buying two to three and uh, we had another disaster, another one which was okay and then another one which did well and I built from there. And then when I went out and I left Hyper and I went out and uh, on my own and I uh, joined uh, Luke Jenningston uh, prior to setting up Sackville Donald. And it was actually from Waterman Stud who asked me to buy foals. And I've bought foals ever since. I've never done it for Ed. Um, I mean, Ed is the only guy who listens to who I buy it for, <laughs> and I buy it for uh, Ed and uh, a syndicate of his mates. That was about ten years ago, nine years ago, perhaps. Okay, great. And we've already had an outspoken comment from Roger O'Callaghan. I don't think it will be the last outspoken comment we get from Roger. Roger, when we, you know, you. you Kind of across the whole breadth of um, the industry, you stand stallions at Tally Ho, you, you, you breed them, you, you, uh, you breed with some wonderful horses, Fairyland most recently, but you also pin hook. You know, where would pin hooking be in, your li in the list of things you do at Tally Ho? Would it be uh, at the top of the list in terms of the, the, your favorite things you do? Sure, I suppose it is, yeah. You, you, should, you can't beat selling a good horse, whether you buy it or sell it. It's uh, very satisfying. Okay, great. Well, the definition of a pin hooker is a practice of buying a young racehorse cheaply in the expectation of selling it later at a profit. Now, the expectations might be a bit dampened this year, but we're going to give it a go and listen to our experts as to how they describe what's the best approach to buying foals. As you've, in every week, we have a Q&A function, so you can click the Q&A button um, on your screen. If it's available to you, if you're watching on YouTube, please feel free to email in and any questions you do have. Um, but as we go along, I'll pick up on those questions and we can talk through them. But the first thing I wanted to talk about is budget buying. You know, there's a lot of people um, watching right now and they, you know, they, have, they, they might have only a 10 grand, 20 grand, and they're buying their first foal and they're looking at the three experts and they're saying, I want to be one of you and I want to, and I can do that. I'm going to start off my 10 grand foal and build from there. And I suppose, Philip, you have wonderful success. You know, you, you, you don't always buy the conventional foal. You know, you, you, you've sold a Sindar recently for 300,000 at the October two yearling sale. You pin hooked you know, a Harzan last year successfully. You, you think you bought a Cable Bay. You know, you don't always buy the obvious stallions. And for people that are trying to buy in a budget, what advice would you have for them? Well, you know, it's, it's um, um, I think if you follow the obvious path, 
um, you have many more competitors. So it's, it's uh, sometimes useful to look on the side and like with Harsand, um, some, some of my competitors, when I bought a Harsand for the last year to Pinogit, they were laughing at me and saying, what do you want to do with a Harsand? And I thought it was really <laughs> because Harsand was a very good horse himself. And this was a, a filly um, out of a stakes-based mare, insisted to a stakes-based horse. So um, I thought she will be reasonably cheap because nobody will go there for her as a foal. And I think that's something, um, if, you, if you don't have the money to spend, uh, to spend really uh, big amounts, then you have to look for weaknesses in the, um, on the stallion side. Um, and, um, and, and just hope that you get it right, yeah? but it's luck, as we all know. And Ro Roger, Roger, I'm Roger, just going to say, can I just yeah. say yeah. something there? I think there is an element uh, in that what Philip says and how he's uh, bought horses by Harzand and Sindar and families like that, but based in Germany and the uh, German breeding industry is probably more more renowned for a more <laughs> renowned for staying types and yes. so to have and so to have Philip selling a Harzand or a Sindar or a Siva Moon or whatever it is uh, it it would sit very nicely within his draft whereas someone like Roger for example you know Tally Ho has been very much uh, built on uh, sharp, precocious uh, stallions, Memas, Kotai Glory, obviously the great Kodiak. And so having a, having a horse by a staying stallion may sort of, may not look quite as well matched alongside his sharper types. And Roger, I know, look, you'd, you'd say that the best way to go, get value is to go down to the Tinnacle House draft at Barnham or <laughs> and, you know, you're obviously going to get the best value of foals there. But beyond, you know, those straightforward facts, you know, where would you look for, you know, a bit of budget buying and where people can find a bit of value? Because you you can find value anywhere, Jack. Probably anywhere bar, if I was really honest, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, just, just to do things differently to the rest, really. That's the way, like, as Philip said. And but I suppose for you, you know, it's, you know, and we're going to talk about first season sires later. You've two of those, Memas and Badamas, and a big part of your operation is supporting those stallions and making sure breeders have confidence in in breeding to them that you will come along and you will, you will buy nice foals by those stallions. How important is that for you? The whole circle of life for Tally Ho. Ah, oh, yeah. Should we, as like you said, we have to grease the wheels. You know, if we if we're going to spend all that money buying retiring the horse to stud like the least we can do is go and buy the foals by the guy from the guys that support us you know it's uh makes the world go round absolutely and i'm looking forward to my inns of court in 2021 being bought by you in uh in that <laughs> but uh I, I, ed you know and you're also you know thinking about the yearling market and you're all you know you're, you're approaching that and you're you're a buyer in that market too and when you're thinking about by buying from successful pin hookers, <coughs> pin hookers that do it well, what do you think they all consistently do that makes them, uh, you know, stand out at the top? Oh God, uh, that's a difficult one. Um, Listen to Ed anyway to start with. I, I think that uh, I think that the really successful pin hookers very much have a have a, a, a program and a, a program and an idea uh, before they before they even arrive at the sales so that there is an agenda and there's a plan and you don't go in there blindly thinking oh i just hope that a nice foal is going to walk past and let's bid on it and see what happens i think that there's a huge amount of research goes into it uh, particularly going through the catalog uh, for sure i possibly have an advantage in that uh, having looked at lots of yearlings i have an idea as to what horses uh, i think are potentially going to be the leading first season sire. Sometimes that works, uh, sometimes it doesn't. It, it, it worked for us uh, last year with the Knight of Thunder. Um, having said that, the only reason why we bought the Knight of Thunder was that we saw Paul McCartan uh, bidding on it and we thought if it's good enough for him, it's going to be good enough for us. <laughs> but uh, but I, um, 
you know, uh, if Raj, we got lucky with, but there's other stallions which we've made a judgment on and uh, it's gone the wrong way for us. But I think you certainly need to have some form of a plan. Um, you need to have a plan beforehand and know what it is you're trying to, trying to find. And that's that's really interesting, Ed, you know, and, and Philip, I'd like to touch upon that with you in terms of a plan. You know, when you buy a foal, are you immediately thinking what sale this foal might be going to next year and the kind of where you'd be pitching that foal? Um, yeah, definitely, because um, um, I'm in a, <clears throat> as Ed has said, uh, a little bit in a better position because I'm coming um, over with my earlings from Germany. So it makes no sense for me to um, have earlings uh, spread <laughs> everything. So I try to target horses uh, which are going to, um, you know, book one, book two, um, Goffs Orby or Arcana August, so more for the select size. So for me, buying a horse, um, a Doncaster type, is, is a little bit more difficult. So Too quick for you, you mean? <laughs> you know, um, do you know how many two-year-old winners I've sold percentage-wise? Yeah, it's. Um, I I think it's a little bit unfair to say that we, because I'm from Germany and there's more stamina orientated breeding that I have to do that as well. But anyway, it's it's. Um, I I can cut off um, horses um, of the catalogue which um, I will struggle to get into one of the select sales. What does not mean like um, uh, buying buying horses, you know, if they are exceptional um, individuals um, by a stallion, then um, I might um, I might even buy um, a horse which is not um, already associated with my ideas, but I would like to buy and think, you know, I get him into a select sale and I stand out with with uh, the horse from that crop. Yeah, so I bought. Uh, for example, three years ago, I bought the most expensive Camacho. Camacho was at that time, nobody was really um, looking at that as a high-end um, horse, but I spent, um, I spent over 60000 for him. And, um, and then I sold him in, in uh, book two for more than, for 200 So, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it works with all sorts of stallions, but it might not be with the with the really cheap stallions um, that my my program works with that yeah i have to admit and i also imagine from Philip's point of view that you probably don't really go to doncaster because actually you've got the the, the, the main german sale is a couple of days after doncaster and so you're probably concentrating on your draft there well that as well but uh, but doncaster is far away doncaster is um uh, from my experience i've been there once is a very special place so um, it's not. It's not uh, surrounding. I feel um, that it, it suits me as well as uh, cattle size or or goffs or. Uh, when you were talking about Doncaster being a special place, were you talking about the actual city or? or yeah, was... Cactus Jack said. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> You need special networks, and um, you need, that's it's 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 a special place. I think you all know. Great, and I suppose, guys, we're thinking about that. We're talking about a lot about sires. We're talking about particular sales, but you know, people are thinking when they're looking at these yearlings, or they're, they're looking at these foals, and they're thinking about what they'll be like as yearlings. You know, Roger, you buy an awful lot of foals. Like, are there particular confirmational flaws that other buyers might be a bit suspect on that you'd be able to accept? JP Condren sent in this question. They thought you'd be best to ask uh, answer that one. Oh, th there's no rules, Jack, and we would be a bit more forgiving for the simple reason is we might keep them for the brief and take them to the yearling sale so we'll give them more time for their to improve or for them to catch up if they're late developing you know you're saying there's no rules but i suppose how do you make decisions then because you, you know your parents your brother and you're all sitting down at a table and you're thinking about you know what falls am i going to buy and you're, you're thinking well i'd love to buy that tin kill one but you know why is that why is that course on your list and why is, does you, do you go and buy it or why do you not buy it? Why, what are those decisions that you kind of talk about together that are driving your decision making? Sure, half the time we don't talk about it, we just go and buy it and worry about it afterwards or try and buy it. 
<laughs> Most of it's uh, lastminute.com, to be honest. You know. <laughs> That's why you're so brave. <laughs> <laughs> Mad, you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that's, and, that's, and, and it's helpful for the bollockings afterwards that she yeah, 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 there's yeah, someone yeah. to blame. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's always, there's, someone's always wrong. Right, so when, you, when you buy a foal, is it always you and Tony and Henry, or is it sometimes just you, or is it sometimes just Tony? How, do, how, do, how does that work? Uh, yeah, it's a bit of everything. It, it just depends. <clears throat> the only rule is we have to put our hand up beforehand between the three of us, like if we want to. Learn. Once the hammer is knocked, that's it. Like if, if you want in a day later, it's too late. And would you, would you set out every year, Roger, with a certain number? Is there any kind of... Or no. In terms of fault, no, nothing? The, the, only time the, uh, the only time we stop is when the sale stops. <laughs> and, and even then, you know, you might not be stopping. You might be off to the yard after that. So I don't know if that's actually a true <laughs> statement. But, uh, I, yeah, but I think and that's a really... Because it's one something I'm interested to talk about, you know, assembling a team and, assemb you know, and Philip... You might have a contrasting view in that. Is there a certain number of horses you want to book one every year or is there an approach you take? No, uh, not a certain number I want to have in book one, but um, you know, um, I have only a limited number of boxes um, in, um, on my farm anyway, so I can't find numbers. So I, I try to focus on, um, you know, like um, I, bought, I bought seven last year, and I bought um, 70 year before. So I would say that's, that's pretty much the biggest number. Maybe I could buy 10, but I couldn't buy 20 or 30 or whatever. So I, I, I focus on a, on a smaller number, yeah. And I think, you know, it's, it's interesting to hear uh, Roger talk about confirmation and, you know, his, it, there's no rules. Are there particular things you like to see in a full, Philip, that, you, that kind of attracts you to them? Me, yeah, uh, uh, to be honest, um, I like to see an athlete, yeah. I like to see, uh, um, normally, they, they, for me, they must, they must be able to walk. And, um, and if, if I see that, then, um, yeah, I'm, I'm depending then on the, on, the, on the page, on the sire, on the dam, I'm, I might be a little bit more forgiving on confirmation and everything. But overall, I, I try to get... Um, as I'm targeting the, the select sales, I, I'm, I'm pretty, well, I try to be quite selective um, what I buy and what I leave. Yeah. And Ed, I suppose going back to your success, pin hooking, and uh, like when you, when you think about <coughs> the full sales and you're picking up a catalog, you know, and you're developing that shortlist, is there a particular approach you take in the methodology of what you'll go look at? Yeah, and see what it's like or is it a case of just you'll see everything in the sale and then work back from there um no i'll certainly go through the catalog beforehand and uh, i'm lucky uh, as is certainly uh, roger and that rather than just me looking i also have uh, have a player helping me and so i'll go I, I think often there's too many horses to look at and i'll go through it and i will um knock off some horses on pedigree uh and there's some hope, some certain stallions or uh, female pages which I'll knock off, and and then I will um, go through it like that. And it, it is a big help having somebody else to help me. Uh, but anything which a player has a look at, and which he leaves leaves on the list, I will then uh, relook at. But certainly we do go through the catalogue first of all, and we'll el eliminate certain um, certain horses. Hey, sorry, well, Ed, you get a lot more time to look at the yearlings than you do the foals, though, don't you? A huge amount more time. I mean, looking at foals, I'd normally look at them twice. Uh, and I also would, I find that I look at a, uh, I look at a foal a lot quicker than I would a yearling. Um, I think partly that's because um, buying foals um, or buying yearlings, you're uh, spending somebody else's mon money. Often it's a... Uh, it's a bigger budget and so uh, you have to be incredibly attentive and make sure that um, you make, <coughs> make uh, very little mistakes. Uh, but when, a, um, when the foals come out... Um, now we hear the secrets why it's easier to sell foals and um, dip more typical <laughs> yearlings, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just looking at some of these questions. I quite like some of these questions which have come up. 
<laughs> you, if you'd want to take one of the questions, you can, of course, Ed. Um, is there anything that jumps out at you? Yeah, I'll be directed quite from the anonymous to you, actually. One is from the anonymous attendee. They're quite a good question. But you should probably read them out uh, yourself, Jack, as you have a host. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. And I, I'm not sure if it's referring to horses or uh, But they're asking me a size everything when it comes to the full sales. I, I, I do like a big foal. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, actually, talking about size, you know, at, um, uh, at Waterman Estad, uh, they, they've got a, they're in a fortunate position that they have a huge amount of land. And I found historically that uh, horses, which may be quite, uh, quite weak as foals, um, appeared to do quite well on the land at, uh, at Watton. So I always do quite like buying a, um, a foal, which we think is a real improver. Uh, obviously, it doesn't always work, but um, some of our more successful pin hooks are horses which have looked a little bit on the weak side uh, at the sales and have been really thrived um, once we brought them back to a... Uh, that brought them back to Watton. And Philip, how important is betting for you in the process of buying foals? Is it, it, how much emphasis would you put on your vet? Well, again, as I'm, I'm buying more or less for the, for the select sales, um, I, I, every foal is vetted. And uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy one without vetting. Um, it, it's um, depending on the price I would have to pay Oh, I think I have to pay. Um, I would like to have x-rays, but that's not. Uh, Philip, that's rubbish. Where's the time? I've never, I've never vetted a foal in my life. Never, ever, ever have I vetted a foal. But you are such so much better judges than me, so that's great. <laughs> no, I, uh, you know, I get the question asked. I, I, I just uh, do it that way. So we, we, we check the foals. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily x-ray um, uh, the foals, uh, but I would like to, to have them better than um, just, um, if I might have overlooked, as Ed said, you know, sometimes the time um, is, is very short and you, have, you, do not, you, you can't focus on everything. And then um, it's good you have a vet um, who, who just checks um, if I've overlooked a, a problem um, in the in the in the in the quick uh, um, inspection, yeah. And Roger, you're saying that's uh, and I, I respect what Phil's saying. Uh, Philip's saying absolutely, but you're saying, in your opinion, that's rubbish. What, what, why is that so? Well, sure, because foals change so much, and vets are like us. We, you know, we're, we all make mistakes, like, and you know what you see today might be the opposite in twelve months. Like there's numerous examples uh, of horses failing the vet as a foal and passing as yearlings. And Ed, go back to you because you you seem to agree with uh, with Roger. But like it's quite interesting because you know you buy a lot of horses sacked with Donald for Hong Kong. There's a big emphasis on X-rays and uh, passing the vet for a Hong Kong horse. Is that are you explaining to some of your clients in the yearling market that look? This, they're also a, a, a horse that's developing and perhaps we shouldn't put, place so much emphasis on x-rays on betting. How, how does your more, approach contrast from foals to yearlings? I think it's probably more of a way sort of the system which we have and the system we have is that on so let's say the, on the Friday of Tattersalls, um, so the select day of Tattersalls on the Friday, my short list would be about 80 to 100 horses and I will have all of those horses on my list 80 to 100 of them and then I will sit in the ring all day and if something falls slips through the net which I perceive as being value then uh, we'll buy it and if I had all of those horses vetted then it means that my vet bill is going to be about 20,000 quid now when I say that a horse being value I mean we would have the Barwies and Frankels on our list, which make four, five, six thousand, and our budget is a is eighty grand or something like that. And we're simply we're looking for what we perceive as being value. Hence, we have the long list, and because we do it like that, I simply I, I we couldn't afford to have them bettered. And also, I want to look at the positives of a horse, and I find often. Uh, the vet just creates negatives. They never say anything positive. They only say negative stuff. So, you know, I'd rather look at the positive stuff. And also, there's 
there's a fair amount of, of, of goodwill from vendors and having a, a good relationship with vendors. And if there's a horse which I like and, you know, a vendor may just say, perhaps it's not for you. And then on we go and on to the next one. Okay, well, I hope my darling mother isn't watching being at their profession as a vet, but we won't, uh, we won't dwell on well, that. Yeah, I'm, sure she's, I'm sure she's cooking your tea, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, Roger, I suppose I'm interested to go back to vetting with you. And Brian Dowley just sent me a question there. He emailed it to me. And he, he's asking, is there a particular age where you think vetting is appropriate? Like we're coming up to the breeze up sales. A lot of these <sighs> need vet reports. Do you think it's an appropriate stage then that we that more reliance is based on a vet? No, the only time you need a vet report is when you're buying to go to stud. So that's it. My, my, well, my mother doesn't do many vet. She's more a reproductive vet, so she doesn't need to do this. But that's the, it's going to be yeah, out of business. Need... The industry is going to be out of business. But look, uh, <laughs> I, 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 that's really interesting. And I suppose... We'll go back to more pedigree and looks and we talked about you know we've heard different things we've seen Ed is a big fan of size and uh, we've heard Philip is very discerning in terms of once an athlete and um, when we talk about pedigree and first season sires this year you know does it Roger you're standing two of them you must be very excited when you saw Memas top the list of Royal Ascot nominees with their it's kind of like the nightclub uh, VIP pass to get a priority pass into the, in, into the, uh, the club but Philip, when you looked at foals last year and you went to sell them as yearlings um, in 2019, were there any first season sires that are about to have their first runners that caught your eye that you think might be ones to watch? You are talking about in, uh, the, the runners last year. To, uh, the runners this year. So, Cable, so um, uh, Memas, Badamas, Territories, the Gurkha, Print, uh, Pride of Dubai, all, all the, the 2020 um, first runners. I'd say that Badamas is probably the only one Philip's heard of. <laughs> I had, you know, the Vatamos was produced here on the farm, yeah, so um, yes, there is a relation, but... Uh, but you never sent him a mare, Philip, you've no idea. <laughs> <one. laughs> no, um, I haven't, um, um, but she was here, her stem was here, and she was covered, you know, I, I walked her personally into uh, Monsoon at Schlenderhahn at that time, but anyway, uh, now coming back, I... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not really focusing on these horses. I think it's a, it's a huge lottery. Um, if you get it right, like we bought a cable bay, as you said, I bought two cable bays um, and, um, um, that year. And we were, we were lucky uh, with that horse. Uh, the one made a lot of money and the other one um, we, we didn't, um, was not well able to sell. So she ran in our colors and she won twice or two in England. So um, yes, but I I haven't I haven't bought any um, any offspring of stallions um, which have two year old runners this year. Okay, and that's very interesting. So if you're buying the elite kind of horse, you might stay away from first season stallions, um, or certainly unproven stallions. But Ed, is there, you know a lot of people that are tuning in. They're you know they're breeding at a lower level. They're trying to find a bit of value, and they're thinking you know can I breed my mare to something that's going to get runners this year? Is there anything, you know, at a budget you'd be advising that people have a look at? i tell you, at a budget, uh, a stallion which had, I thought, incredibly good-looking, uh, very nice quality horses was uh, Pearl Secret. He doesn't stand at a huge amount, and uh, I really liked the, uh, the Pearl Secret um, Pearl Secret foals when I saw them, and obviously the Pearl Secret yearlings. Uh, so he's one which I would, which I would have in mind. Uh, uh, at a slightly higher bracket, uh, the territories. I was very keen to buy territories, having really liked the territories yearlings. Um, sadly, I didn't get to buy a, didn't get to buy a territories. Um, for actual foals uh, on the ground at the moment, um, I looked at a huge amount of uh, Kota Glories because Alistair, my business partner, uh, bought Kota Glory as a uh, as a yearling, and so we we're obviously very keen to have a look at his progeny. And um, I'm, uh, you know, not trying to, uh, to to make Roger blush, but I thought the Kota Glories were incredibly nice, uh, incredibly nice foals, and he's obviously um, stands at a very affordable price. Okay, he'd be too quick for Philip anyway. <laughs> oh, why? <laughs> <laughs> And Roger, we're about to find out if these horses are quick um, that uh, Philip refuses to buy. Um, 
uh, you know, I'm not your, your list of stallions that you're looking, you know, perhaps you might you might touch upon your own stallions, and then perhaps the stallion you wish you bought. Looking at the um the the ones at runners this year. Ah, oh, yeah, sure. Look, uh, look, me master. The time for talking has to stop, and and the winning has to start. So hopefully it'll happen. Um, but it, it look all the guys are making the right noises, so hopefully it will happen. You know, Varmas a little bit more. We have to be a bit more patient, but we have one. We have two breeze of horses by Varmas now that look quite um, quite smart. And if I if I was to back uh, an outsider, I would probably have Twilight Sun. Okay, Twilight Sun, an outsider, notwithstanding the fact he's second favourite. So, the, the, well, I didn't not, know that to be honest. I, no, no, I, there you go. No, 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 that's just, that was just your money being put down. You know, you, you got the shrewd prices early on. Um, yeah, <laughs> he had a good winner yesterday, in fairness to him. Uh, he did, I saw it. Um, and I suppose now I'd like to open it out to questions. You know, we, there's loads to discuss about pin hooking and the, uh, our three experts' approaches, very contrasting approaches, as we've heard. Um, if we kind of touched upon, there's lots of questions being submitted. We've, um, we've 127 people online at the moment. If, I suppose, guys, if we're thinking through, and uh, Philip, I might touch upon you. You know, you I thought it was very interesting. You said you forget about unproven stallions and you focus on proven, proven no, sources of... Uh, I didn't math. say that. I okay. didn't say that. So what, what, what would you be saying? If someone came to you with a million quid to buy a number of folds, what would, advice would you say to set about that task? Million quid, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I would, I would like to, uh, to put together um, um, a bunch of foes. Um, I think, um, you know, something like, uh, uh, you know, between five and ten foes in uh, different brackets. And um, I would, I would like to buy, especially maybe in this time, it's, it's a good idea to have a, um, have a well-bred filly. Um, where the, the the value is there, um, so with a good with a good dam line by a good sire, um, and um, and obviously then something um, you know I, I have been underbidder for example on Magna Gracia something like that would be would be nice to have in the in the bunch, um, so um, a, a, a cold fold which um, looks like a classic prospect and could be um, a selling later on yeah. You have to focus then really on quality and buy numbers. I would certainly agree on a uh, on a well-bred filly. I think uh, in book one last year, uh, well-bred fillies um, certainly uh, you know did incredibly well, and you know I I, I do think a well-bred filly would be a good prospect. Okay, and Roger, would you echo that? If you maybe more at the kind of you know lesser. Um, not maybe not the million quid client, but if someone was saying, "Listen, I have a hundred grand. I want to assemble a, a few folds." What advice would you be giving as they open up their sales catalogs come October, November time? Oh, well, take their time and have an open mind. Okay, take take their time, and you've just said it's lastminute.com for you, so it's kind of a contrast. Hey, last minute, lastminute.com. When we're in the ring and there's a fold making money we can afford. Okay, okay. And I, I suppose, how many times would you view a fall, Roger? You know, you talked about you don't rely on vets. How many times would you need to get a view a fall before you've got a good sense of the fall? Uh, probably maximum twice. Yeah, I would agree, twice. Yeah. Sure, we don't have time to see them. Sure, you know, Jack, when you're selling those falls on the good day in Goffs or the, the good day in Tats there, you, you probably have 36 hours in the box. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely, and it's a great. I suppose it's a great challenge of pin hookers that you have to then make your decisions very quickly. Quick. Yeah. What's interesting about that, though, Roger, is you know you're talking about 36 hours in a box, and you need to view these foals. But the foals then get tired. You know, if the foals get. You know, they they get frustrated. They're it's a new experience for them. They have big time. How do you kind of think about behaviorally how that foals adapt to the sale and how that affects your buying decision? Uh, well, you, you, yeah. If you like, if you, look, when the fall comes out the door, if you like him, you'll always give him a second chance. But you know, Jack, it, it's up to you as the vendor to kind of you know, try and have the fall as well schooled as possible too. You know, I know you can't 
legislate for everything they do. But, you know, if you have your work done, it'll, they'll usually perform for you. I certainly find uh, when you're talking about um, the time you have to look at foals and everything like that, that often the first time we see them, a horse will walk well. And then when we go back a second time, we begin to question their action. Because a lot of these foals can get very tired. But if they walk for us first time round, then we'll be a lot more forgiving second time round. Well, I look, I look forward to reminding you of that, Ed, in the, in the future months ahead, um, which is a very youthful. I might actually make sure I have the recording handy so I can play it again for you. <laughs> Think about your foes, though. Think about your foes. They're always sort of jig jogging around, they're on their toes, they're bucking and they're kicking, you know. So there's never an opportunity for a walk. Yeah. Oh, you always expect that it's well schooled and well conditioned and everything, so you are a little bit less forgiving if they don't behave. Yeah. No, I don't know about that, but uh, <laughs> I'm really, I'm, you know, and I'm really interested here. We have a poll actually set up and I, I'm conscious we haven't done it yet. And that's, you know, if people had bought a foal last year from one of these stallions with their first runners here this year, what would they have picked listening to our experts and hearing their advice? We heard Roger talk about Memas. We heard him talk about Adamas. Um, Twilight Sun was his dark pick. I'm just sharing that poll at the moment. I'm just interested to see what people pick out as their sire to follow for 2020. We heard um, Ed talk about Pearl Secret. Pearl Secret didn't make the list. We asked people to submit who they thought would be good value. And here we have it. Who is going to be our winner? Well, I'm very... He had... What did he have, Roger? 14, 14 nominations, 415 nominations for Royal Ascot, top of the table, beating out all these established sires. And Mema still can't beat the masses listening in tonight. It's New Bay. New Bay. I noticed that New, Bay, Bay, New Bay's got a horse of that. New Bay has a horse of Dan Kubler's entered at uh, either Newcastle or Kempton. Out of distinctive. Yeah. Out of distinctive. I saw it. I saw. I saw it entered. Yeah. Do you have? A, do you have some? Do you have a tip for us, Ed? That's even more exciting than anything we're talking about. Tonight. No, I just noticed he had a notice He had one entered. You know. And that was his only Royal Ascot entry under the system. So I thought that was striking that Dan went with that approach. And I know Dan... I have got a tip for you, though, actually. Uh, at Newcastle, I think it's tomorrow, Art Power, a Dark Angel uh, horse, uh, bred by um, Owen John. Stanstad. Bred by Owen Stanstad, which I, I believe goes nicely. Bought by my business partner. Okay, great. And I'm delighted to announce Sackville Donald. You can get Ed at ed at sackvilledonald.com. <laughs> He's refunding all losing bets on that horse tomorrow, which is going to be is a real, real exciting opportunity for people listening in tonight. Uh, but you know, I suppose we should go back to Kodiak, Roger, with you, you know, and, and his impact on Tally Ho and how he has, you know, he's, and he's also helped so many foal sellers over the years. <clears throat> how big an, uh, uh, a stallion has he been for you? Massive. Massive. Uh, I I don't I wouldn't know where to start, but uh, um, every year he gets a couple of good horses and they they win loads of races and I still think we haven't seen we might not have seen the best of them yet. But that's my honest opinion. I mean, we've actually just had an anonymous attendee, but a very clued in anonymous attendee tell us was Roger watching the six fifteen at Gulfstream. Off Correct. Wesley Ward at Stone Street, <laughs> a winner by Kodiak. So there we have it, another good good one for uh, for yeah. Kodiak, which is great. And um, like date of birth, Philip. You know, when you're thinking about falls, you know, with another anonymous attendee has submitted this question. How do you think about that? You know, in terms of your buying. Um, uh, to be honest, um, as I'm not buying uh, the, the the March two years or, or April two years usually. Um, I'm, I'm quite forgiving with, uh, with the birth of date and we have had so many good horses born um, in, in May that um, I, 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 I would not, I would, it would not stop me. It wouldn't stop you, but I, I, Ed, you buy a kind of more precocious yearling. Is that something that thinks, you think about when you're buying a foal? How, how big is birth, date of birth for you? I, no, I don't really look at it. Um, I, I would be a little bit, uh, I find a mayfold, it can be quite a, quite a difficult sell. Um, I, I would be more interested if I was going to be analytical about it. I, I look at the, um, the letter the mayor starts with, because obviously before we go into the, um, we go into the sales, 
we know that uh, tassels start with tassels and goths start with one uh, with one letter, and um, Doncaster starts with another. So I always pay particular attention to um, to uh, if I think I have a a, a Doncaster horse, for example. Um, I find historically that selling a um, yearling at Doncaster in the last hour of the sale can be quite hard work, or selling um, at uh, book two in the first half hour of the sale can be quite hard work. So I look at other stuff like that and um, perhaps pay a, a bit of attention, you know, a bit of attention there. Okay, and Roger, you know, in Tinnock Hill, for instance, we we kind of focus. We have a lot of older proven mares. Do you think about an older mare? Does that impact <coughs> your valuation of a horse? No, not really. It's all about what comes out the door, uh, Jack. So if you see an older mare foal, perhaps that's going to affect your decision. But and I think what if you John O'Kelly asks about broodmare sires, and do they have any influence on in your decision making? Is that something you'd look at when you open up a catalogue page? Yes, definitely. I think 100%. Uh, I think that uh, people certainly... Uh, we bought a... Star Spangled Banner uh, filly uh, this year out of a Frankel mare. And being out of a Frankel mare was a huge, uh, was, was a huge bonus, you know? Um, whereas if you were out of a, I'm trying to think of something which I don't- Don't uh, take Cinder, yeah. Too don't, too don't, don't offend anyone, but if you're out of something like a uh, Saki secret mare, um, you know, it's probably not quite as uh, enticing. Okay, that's it. Philip, is that something you think about? And also, Philip, I suppose for the discerning buyer, how have, you know, you're buying for an elite market. How have attitudes changed in that kind of sector that you've adapted to over the years? I, I, uh, can I quickly go and get another beer? I lost you. <laughs> you may get a beer, Ed, yeah, you may Thank get you. a beer. Um, I couldn't understand your question because. Sorry, yeah, I, I, and how have my, the, the the elite market that you operate in, Philip? You know, you buy you buy a very a, a very. I was about to say expensive fold, Philip. I'll say a very high class fold that will prove to be very cheap when you sell it for much <coughs> year. And um, when you do, when you're going through that process, and each year buyers are changing and they're changing their tastes, have you adapted in any way to to what the market wants? Um, to be honest, I like to buy a horse. So, um, and I'm selling a horse and I always think um, if the horse is good enough, yeah, then people will buy it. That's my belief in the market. So, um, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't like to buy a foal by a very obscure sire or by a very obscure uh, broodmare sire. So, I would like to see uh, quality, quality uh, there and proven quality, especially with the dam size, unless, you know, like it's a Frankel, um, obviously it can't be proven, but he's just such a well-bred horse and a well-performed well and very good sire, so I would buy that. But, but overall, I would not like to buy um, 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 offspring of, um, out of a mare where the sire is, is completely useless, I would say, yeah. And, that's it. and talking about the market, I suppose, thinking about this year and selling horses this year, Roger, what's your thoughts about entering into 2020 and the kind of, you know, the present climate in terms of difficulties and how, you're going, how we'll navigate that together? Jeez, uh, um, do you know what, Jack? I'm not sure yet. We have, <clears throat> we have about 40 breeds of horses to sell at the, at the end of next month. So that'll, um, reality will kick in then, I suppose. But... We've had plenty of inquiries for horses, so you know I, I'm relatively optimistic. And once racing is going and everybody gets going, you know, hopefully money will start turning. And you know, we have to get living again. We can't all stay at home and keep our money in our pocket. Well, that well, that's good news for us fall sellers. Um, I suppose, Roger, have you changed the way you do business at all? Have you, have you, in terms of promoting the breeds of horses you have? I see you've got videos online that people can watch at the Tally Ho Horses. Is that something you've consciously done this year? No. No. <laughs> no. 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 We just go. Just uh, you know, people ring up. Uh, people have inquired, rung us which one we like. I have this amount to spend. Have you something for it? And then we might send them a video. But like we haven't done anything we haven't done anything different jack to be honest we just let the horses do the work okay 
Okay, there you have it. If you want the inside scoop, it's the, it's the same as ever. Just WhatsApp Roger O'Callaghan. He'll tell you what the story is, which to, <laughs> to, to adapt to whatever budget you may have. Um, but Philip, I, you know, we've talked about, and I don't know if Ed Sackville has returned with a beer or not. I'm here, I'm here. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I took so long, but uh, he was probably <laughs> fixing his hair. No, no, I'm sorry I took so long, but first of all, it's the butler's day off, and secondly, the kitchen's a long <laughs> way away. <laughs> these, these are and we were just talking about the difficulties in the industry, and it's great to hear you talk so candidly about your own personal struggles, Ed. Um, <laughs> But I, I, you know, thinking about you know moving into Royal Ascot and uh, and the uh, this you know back racing and things like that. Is there are there horses edge that we should be thinking about that you bought as yearlings that you particularly like that you're looking forward to seeing? Um, I know that uh, Tom Dascombe's got a gutter fan uh, which I bought from I bought from Yeoman's Town, um, uh, which he likes very much. I know he's got a Memas also, which runs tomorrow or Tuesday, uh, which he likes very much. Um, but I must admit, uh, I, I think a, a lot of people, although Ask is obviously happening, I think a lot of people are possibly with two-year-olds are putting a little bit of a, a little bit of a line through Ascot and not trying to obviously the time frame between when they can run in a maiden and then run at Ascot is quite short. And I think there's a certain amount of people who are putting a line through Ascot and trying to concentrate on uh, getting a horse to win a maiden and then uh, concentrating on bigger and better things after Ascot. And as well, you know, Philip, I'm kind of trying to bring, you know, if we have any other questions, I'd love to hear them and we've, we're trying to get through as many as we can, but I suppose, bringing it kind of to conclusion and kind of some general teams that people should be looking at because you know the title is how to pin hook a fall it's a very simple title and if you were to reflect on that title and think just two or three simple pieces of advice you would give to people that are going to fall sales that want to buy a fall that they should follow what would be those three simple pieces of advice? Three, three points uh, <coughs> um, <laughs> Well, but I put down, uh, you know, what is a sex successful pinning? Selling for more than the purchase and produce costs. Yeah. That's. <laughs> but um, at the end, no, I'm joking. Um, the the advice is really, um, I I as I said before, I keep it simple. I say, look for as many foes as you can. Look for an athlete, and you may sell that athlete. Somebody will buy it. And um, depending on the budget, you have to be careful uh, which stallions <coughs> um, and um, they, they make the, 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 uh, the prices sometimes um, unaffordable uh, for if you don't have the budget. But uh, if you're having an athlete, you will sell it. And um, as, as we have all said before, um, you know, when you are looking at these foals at the sales, you sometimes have to be forgiving depending on the time of the day you are looking at them. Yeah. If, they're tired, if they have some problems or not, you have to be a little bit forgiving. But at the end, if a foal has walked well, and if a foal was athletic when you have seen it, it will be athletic as a yearling and you will sell it well. That's my belief. And Ed, if I was to turn to you, you know, your piece of advice I took away earlier is just find Paul McCartan, man mark him and just bid more than Paul McCartan, which I thought was striking. But apart from that little snippet, was there anything else you'd highlight to people if they're going out buying foals, what would Ed Sackville say to do? Uh, I, I certainly believe uh, in, in um, safety in numbers. And by that, I mean, if you, if you said I've got 100,000 to spend and I want to buy... I want to buy one foal for a hundred thousand. I would personally say buy two for fifty. Or if you've got a um, hundred and fifty thousand, buy you know three for fifty. I'm a strong believer in safety in numbers. Uh, I think it's very much a numbers game. And if you uh, put all of your eggs in one basket, I think um, sometimes it can it can prove to be difficult. And if you look at uh, all of the horses I've bought. Um, for what a manner historically, um, although we may have made money, um, it's it's very much not not every horse makes money. 
uh, you've got to really spread the risk. Okay, great. And Roger, you've said there's no rules when it comes to confirmation. You've talked about, you know, it's a kind of, it's a gut feel almost for you and it's, it's one built on experience. Is there, you know, if people watching in, they're looking for that little bit of advice from you. Is there anything you'd say that we haven't maybe touched upon so far? If you really like a fall, don't stop bidding. <laughs> Short, sweet, but <laughs> very, very useful for us fall sellers. Short, short, sweet, and absolutely beautiful if you are the vendor. Yeah. <laughs> and even more beautiful if there are two people that are watching tonight that have decided to follow the same mantra, which I'm very much hoping will be the case for many fall sellers next year. Um, this year, in fact. Well, thank you very much to our three panellists. It's been a great discussion. There are great questions that have come online. It's br brilliant to, uh, to discuss pin hooking. Um, if you've got feedback, send it to my Twitter account. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what, what else you'd like to hear about. It's very interesting. Pin hooking was our most ever popular request. We saw that in the registrations, which is great. And it's brilliant we could have such a great panel. Um, if you want to buy a racehorse, you can do so. I know Roger O'Callaghan has texted me. He's buying a share. So he has thought this was a, 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 a suitable investment to make. I haven't seen a text from Ed or Philip yet in, in relation to our can I, just say one, can I just say one thing very quickly on the thing of buying a racehorse? Yes. Which I think is, is important to all of uh, everybody who pin hooks, is that inevitably uh, a lot of the horses you buy may not make money. But if a horse which you buy is a failed pin hook financially, and it turns out to be a good race. A good horse. Yeah. Then that is still a success because yes, you you as the vendor, what you want to be seen is you want to be you want to be seen selling good horses. And so, even if you lose money, if your horse goes on to be a good horse, actually, it's a success. Yeah. I totally agree. And, you know, Roger's talked about having 40 breeze-up horses. We've heard of the impact the Irish breeze-up market uh, sellers have. You know, we have, what, 85, 90% of the breeze-up horses in England and Ireland and France. It's going to be, it's a hugely important part of the industry and it's very important we support. Judging, um, judging by the amount of times I've heard Roger's uh, telephone go ping in the last hour, I'd say <laughs> he's probably only got 20 breeze-up horses left for sale now. You know? and, and that's tragic for uh, syndicates trying to buy these horses, but we're going to give it a go. We're going to try to find, find value. And if we find value and we resell it to Ed, Ed Sackville in a few no, uh, no. months' time, Jack, we're very the, excited about it. Jack, which, which agent are you using to buy your, uh, Ed, to buy your Ed, breeze up? We, Ed, we are open to all offers in terms of advice. And uh, I would love to hear uh, after this call as to what you could do for us. Jack, the best bit of value Ed ever got was in Turkey. It was never in tats or goths. There we go. This is what he's talking about. Look at it. Absolutely. <laughs> you know what? I used to look. I used to look like Philip, and now. <laughs> what do you mean? You. <laughs> <laughs> there you. Have, there you have it. Perhaps Roger's right. Maybe sometimes when you have a fall, you need and you need to improve the looks. Maybe an interventionist strategy is actually <laughs> needed, and Turkey is where you need to go to find that. <laughs> But the growth required in your full right. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. It's been a great discussion. Um, and I hope you have a, a great rest of the weekend. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. See you at the breeze-ups. <laughs> See you later. <laughs>